We're picking up in our study on, on not just on the Holy Spirit, but on the filling of the Holy Spirit and what happens when believers are filled. If you look in Acts chapter 2, remember the day of Pentecost had come and they were all the disciples and, and, a hundred and uh, over a hundred others were gathered in an upper room. They were praying and as they were praying, God fulfilled his promise and God sent the Holy Spirit to his people. When the Spirit came, the Bible says it sounded like a, a mighty rushing wind, like a, a freight train barreling down from heaven. And in a moment, everyone there, every believer there, uh, not only heard this sound, but they all saw a sight. On top of every believer uh, appeared a little flame of fire. Now, in the Old Testament, we've already seen, I won't go back into it today, but we've already seen that uh, the flame of fire was representation of the presence of God. Uh, the sight and the sound really combined together were signs for the Jews that the Messianic age had come. In fact, the Jews believed that when the Spirit came, when the breath from heaven came, there would be a great sound, referring back to Ezekiel's prophecy. So this sound they heard from heaven, the sight of the, of the flame, it was all a sign that Jesus Christ really, really was the Messiah. The Spirit of God has been poured out on mankind, and we have now entered into the Messianic age. Verse 4, though, is what we've really been focusing on. So we know, if you're a Bible student, you know that the, the Spirit of God came and He indwelt believers. But it's not just that He indwelled believers. Verse 4 tells us, Acts 2, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So it's not just that they were indwelt by the Spirit, but in this moment they were filled by the Spirit of God. Now the word filled here simply means controlled. They were brought under the full control of the Holy Spirit. This is not a feeling in the sense of content. It's not like filling something up to the brim. It's not about substance. It's about submission. The idea here, when we're told that they were filled with the Spirit, it simply means that they came under the complete, utter, absolute control of the Holy Spirit. They were absolutely surrendered to His will, to His way. He took control. Every believer... Now, the book of Acts is, is somewhat transitional. Uh, so you can look at Acts and you can't really say what happens in Acts will necessarily happen again. But the reality is every single believer, if you are truly in Christ, every believer is commanded without any hesitation to surrender himself to, or herself to the authority of the indwelling Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, it's not really an option whether you're full of the Spirit or not. You are commanded by God to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Just like the drunk is influenced by alcohol, just like his inhibitions are taken away, just like his behavior changes under the influence, so when the Spirit comes into a man and the Spirit is given full control of that man, he will change the way that man lives life, the way that man acts, the way that man behaves. The drunk has certain consequences that comes with drunkenness, and so in the same way, the believer has certain consequences that comes when they are controlled by the Spirit of God. So far we've looked at four, we're going to look at the, the fifth and the sixth today. Number one, when believers are filled with the Spirit, when they're under the control of the Spirit, number one, Christians are empowered. The disciples were able to do something in this moment that they, through their education, through their practice, through, uh, through their own talents, their own gifts, they were able to do something that they could not have otherwise done, and that was that they were able to speak in Aramaic, and everyone heard them in at least 15 different languages. So number one, when we are filled with the Spirit, we will be enabled to do things that we could not do in our own strength. A second thing that happens when men are filled with the Spirit is that criticism should be expected. Remember the, the, the Jews said, oh, they're just drunk. And Peter stood up and he said, oh yeah, they're intoxicated, but not the way you think. They're under the control of, of not a substance, they're under the control of a spirit. Now, whenever you're filled with the spirit, you can always expect criticism. And the criticism you'll receive is usually going to be from highly religious people. Remember, it was devout Jews that criticized. And the reason they criticized here was because God's never spoke to me like that, so God couldn't speak to anybody else like that. So when you are filled with the Spirit, yes, you'll be criticized, some may say, by the liberal left, but you'll also be criticized by the hard right who cannot accept, who cannot even begin to think that it might be the Holy Spirit doing that work through you. So when we're filled with the Spirit, Christians are empowered, criticism is expected. The third thing we saw is that Christ is exalted. 
Now, Peter, who had earlier uh, denied that he even knew Christ, stood up right after they made this accusation, and he says, men and brethren, they're not drunk. It's only 9 a.m. in the morning. And then he went on to say, what you're seeing here is the fulfillment of the prophecies of Joel. Joel said in the last days that the father would pour out his spirit on, on his sons and daughters and young men would prophesy and, and people would dream dreams. Joel, he says, what you're seeing today is actually the fulfillment of prophecy. And then Peter looks at these people. Many of these people in the group are the ones who actually crucified Christ. They were there when they nailed him to the cross. They were the ones in the mob yelling, crucify, crucify, crucify. Peter, who earlier denied that he even knew Jesus because he was afraid for his life, he stands up and he basically points a finger at that group and he says, Jesus, the one you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Messiah. He's been risen from the dead. When a man is filled with the Spirit, what the Spirit does is the Spirit exalts the Son. So when a man is filled with the Spirit, that man, his life, his words are going to exalt Jesus Christ as well. We come to number four this morning, what happens when people are filled with the Spirit these consequences of control, the fourth consequence we see in the text is that conviction is experienced. Now we're told in John chapter 16, verse 8, that when the Spirit comes, Jesus said when He comes, He is going to convict the world. He says there's three things He'll convict the world of. He'll convict the world of sin, He'll convict the world of righteousness, and of judgment. Now I'm not going to go into those three categories, but here, after on the day of Pentecost, this promise is being fulfilled. The Holy Spirit has come to dwell in believers, to work in the world. And being filled with the Spirit, Peter stands and he preaches. And when he preaches, he exalts Christ. But you'll notice when he preaches, he doesn't, he doesn't take a text and read the text and then yell about something else for an hour. No, when Peter stands to preach, he takes an Old Testament text and he expounds that text. He says, this is what the text was saying, this is what it meant. That's what we do every Sunday. In his exposition of the text, though, he could not avoid exposing the guilt of the Jews. Because he said to them, Jesus, God manifested right in front of your eyes through wonders, through works. God manifested him. God made known that he was his Messiah. God made it known that Jesus was his very son born in human flesh. And that Jesus, the, the very Son of God, you took him and by wicked hands you crucified him. You murdered him. You have the very blood of God on your hands. As he stands and preaches, the, the Jews began to realize their, their guilt. You see, an exposition of Scripture will expose the crimes of people. I don't have to stand here and name every sin this morning because if I faithfully just preach the Scripture, sin is going to be named, sin is going to be exposed, it can't be avoided. Well, here he stood and he's preached this message. And as he's preached this message, verse 37 says, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Now, I find verse 37 so interesting because, I'll be honest, that's not often my experience. Most preachers, if they were honest today, say when they stand and when they preach, that we could say, and when they heard this, they slept on. When they heard this, they yawned. When they, when they heard this, they, they looked at their watch. But that's not what happened here. After Peter preaches this, this message, after he exalts Christ, the scripture says that they, the crowd, were cut to the heart. This phrase, cut to the heart, literally they were pierced. They were stabbed. Their hearts were torn in two. Their hearts were broken. And what their hearts are broken over here is their own sin. They're not concerned about what anybody else has done, what anybody else has said. They are concerned here about their own rebellion against God. You see, when the Holy Spirit is active, when men are filled with the Spirit, conviction will be experienced. Conviction is the Holy Spirit stabbing the heart with the sharp truth of the Word. Conviction is the act of the Spirit convincing a man that he is a guilty sinner in great need of a Savior. Have you ever noticed, no matter how hard you try, you cannot convince a man that he needs Christ? I mean, you can, you can tell him everything the Old Testament says, everything the New Testament says. You can expose his sin, but you cannot convince a man, no matter how hard you try, you cannot convince him that, that he's in need of Christ. You can't even convince him that he's a sinner. Now, he can be standing there where he just lit the cat on fire, holding the tail in the hand, but, but still, I'm not really a sinner, right? We cannot convince men that they are sinners. But when the Holy Spirit begins to work, he pins a man, he pins a woman to the mat, and he leaves them in a position where they cannot help but see, I have sinned, I have offended a holy God. 
David said of his sin, against thee and thee only have I sinned. When the Spirit is at work, he brings us to understand our sins are not chiefly offenses against other people. Our sins are not just little shadows. Our sins are deep, terrible darkness. They are rebellion. They are acts of hatred towards God. But it's only the Spirit that can show somebody that. The Word, the Bible, is powerful, but it's also painful. Because when, when a man preaches the Word, when he, when he gives the Word as, as it's written, what it does is it shows us how far from God we really are. It shows us our, our moral ineptitude. And not just that we, are, uh, that we have missed the line, but it shows us that we've crossed every line that God says don't cross. Peter has stand here and he's preached and he's bluntly informed the crowd, you have the blood of God on your hands. Now, if, if he said that today, people would just laugh. The idea of God means nothing to people. The idea of a, of a deity, of a supreme being, it's something we dismiss. It's something we divorce from our mind. But in this period, when he said that, these people took the idea of, of God very seriously. And when he looks at them and says, you have God's blood on your hands, I can almost imagine them standing there, not literally, but figuratively. They can almost see the blood of God dripping off their own hands. And as they hear that, they hear the great offense of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that our sin is so terrible, it has not only cost the Son of God his life, it shows us that we are the ones who put him on the cross. As, as Peter preaches here, they realize that they, in essence, have crucified the Son of God. They see that not only have they crucified the Son of God, but their every sin they've ever committed has been an assassination attempt against God Himself. Do you realize every sin that you and I commit, think about this, every sin you commit, every sin I commit is an assassination attempt on God. You say, well, I wouldn't take it that seriously. Let me explain. Sin is a declaration that I will rule the universe God created. It's exactly saying the same thing Satan himself said, I will sit my throne above his throne. When we sin, when God says don't, and we do anyway, we are basically putting the bullseye on God and trying to take God out so that we can rule the universe that he created. Sin is terrible because it is an assassination attempt against God. And here these Jews realize that not only have they attempted to assassinate God, they have literally assassinated the Son of God. They realize that their, their sin is terrible. The attitude, not just, even the action, the action is bad enough, but the attitude that says that, that I will exalt myself above the Father, that attitude is heinous, and that attitude deserves the death penalty. And when you, when you stand, and when I stand, and I tell men and women that their sin is so heinous, their sin is so terrible, that it deserves capital punishment, that's not a pill that's easy for most people to swallow. That's offensive. For me to tell you that your, your iniquity against God is so, so dark, so depraved, so absolutely detestable and unacceptable that, that the only way to pay for it is eternal death, separated from God, suffering in hell. When I say that your sin and my sin is that bad, that's hard for people to take huh? because my sin's not that bad. The gospel is the message, though, that Christ has, has died for these sins. So on the one hand, you have this idea that sin is so heinous, so terrible, that it requires eternal punishment. But on the other hand, you have in the gospel the promise that God himself has paid for our eternal punishment. But that's a hard pill to swallow because it's saying that I am completely lost and without Christ I have no hope. It's offensive to the natural mind. But I said all this to point this out. I want you to notice that rather than being offended... They don't leave the church this morning saying, I can't believe the preacher said that. <laughs> After Peter preached this message, rather than being offended by his sermon, the people that were present were offended by their sin. You never see that happen, do you? They're not offended by what Peter has said. They're offended by what they have done. They're offended at themselves. And being offended by your own sin only happens when the Spirit of God is at work and the Spirit of God has opened your eyes to your own debauchery. What the Spirit does, He uses the Word to cut through our hardness, convict us of our rebellion. It's the Spirit, it's the Spirit alone who convinces us that we, need a need, we have a need for a Savior. When I was in college, I was in an RA meeting, there was a, a girl sitting in front of me. And she was talking about this little girl that she was trying to bring to Christ, and she said, you know, I've tried everything. I've asked her, doesn't she want to go to heaven? She says, no. 
I said, well, don't, don't you want to be with your friends? And she says, no. And I said, well, don't you want to know Jesus? And she says, no. And, and she sit there and she said, and I just cannot figure out how to get her saved. And literally, I was sitting behind her wanting to scream, you don't. <laughs> you can't save her. You can't convince her she needs Christ. In fact, if you convince her, you might get her baptized, you might get her wet, but you won't get her into heaven. I, literally, I was screaming out inside, you're trying to do the Holy Spirit's work, and what you need to do is stop. You see, we can't convince people they need a Savior, but when the Spirit is active, people can't fight against His convincing, His convicting work. Conviction is a work of the Spirit, and if He doesn't do it, it can't be done. It's the Spirit who cuts, it's the Spirit who cures. Now, but we're talking about the feeling of the Spirit. So what does this have to do with us? I think that just this idea that it's the Spirit who does this work should bring a certain sense of sobriety in us. Because we see so little conviction today. And we could come up with all kinds of reasons why there's so little conviction, but... I think we should be sober here because it really should lead us to the conclusion the lack of conviction is one reason for the lack of conversions. Would we agree with that? The lack of conviction is a reason for the lack of conversions. But if that's true, then one reason we see so little fruit is probably because we are so little filled. If it's the Spirit who does this work, and when Peter stood up filled with the Holy Spirit and preached, the Spirit did the work of conviction, Maybe instead of casting the blame on the outside, one of the reasons the church sees so little conversions is the church, the members of the church, are not filled with the Spirit. You see, control precedes conviction, and conviction precedes conversion. Now, I'm not saying that God needs you. I'm not saying that God can't save anybody without you. But I am saying there is a direct correlation between God's people being filled with the Spirit and speaking the truth in love and sinners coming under conviction and being converted. We, if we are to assess ourselves honestly, have to ask, why is it that we preach the same message Peter preached, but we don't receive the same results Peter received? And there are many answers that I think could be accurately given to that question, but one answer that we need as the church to wrestle with is that Peter was filled with the Spirit while most of us are only filled with self. And because we're filled with self instead of the Spirit, we do not see what Peter saw. Conviction in this modern age has been marginalized. We tell people, oh, just follow Jesus. Your life doesn't have to change. You know, nothing, you don't have to give up anything. Just follow Jesus. Conviction has been marginalized. And I think one of the reasons we've marginalized conviction is because without realizing it as the church, we've marginalized conviction because we've also minimalized the work of the Spirit. And we're trying through all other kinds of means and methods to get people in the kingdom when there's not only one door, there's really only one way to even see the door is necessary, and that's through the work of the Spirit. So as God's people, as we look at this, our prayer, our realization should be, let's not look at the problem with them, let's look at the problem with me. One of the reasons that I am not seeing fruit in the field is because I am not filled with the Spirit. So many people feel so little of the Spirit's convicting power, and I think that that's because we, as God's people, experience so little of the Spirit's controlling power. When Peter preached under the control of the Spirit, the Spirit brought conviction, and conviction led to crisis. Look at verse 37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. When they heard Peter preach this message of sin and of judgment, of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment. When Peter preached this message, the people were cut to the heart. They weren't offended at what Peter said. They were offended at what they had done. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Their question was, what must we do to remedy what we have done? We see we are guilty before God. We have crucified God's own Son. What should we do? Now, this, this actually makes me feel a lot better here because now Peter delivers sermon number two, right? And I do this every Sunday. I finish sermon number one, and then I give sermon number two in the invitation. That's literally what Peter does here. So now I have a biblical basis for what I do every Sunday, okay? Peter gives some sermon number two. The problem, they already know that they have been exposed as sinners. So Peter now reaches straight for the prescription, verse 38. They say, what do we do? Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So he says to them, repent. Repenting is literally turning from the direction you're going in an opposite direction. 
And the direction they had been going was in the firm belief that Jesus was a counterfeit, that Jesus was not Messiah, that Jesus had no authority over them or over their lives. And Peter says, if you want to be forgiven, repent of that attitude. Repentance is a change of attitude that leads to a change of action. So it's a, it's a change of heart that changes the way I behave. The change of heart necessary for them was a change of heart, a change of mind towards Jesus. They had, just 50 days earlier, they had ridiculed him as a criminal. So repentance for them would be to recognize he was not a criminal, he was God's very Christ, he was Messiah. So Peter says, if you want to be forgiven, the first prescription is repent. But then he says, the second part is be baptized. So first he says, turn away from what you have done. Second, he says, turn to whom you did it to. He says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now this is complicated for some people because they read this and they think, okay, well then salvation is necessary or baptism is necessary for salvation. But that's not at all what's going on here. Scripture never contradicts itself, and Scripture elsewhere has made it clear that baptism alone does not produce salvation. Salvation is by the grace of God through our faith in Christ. So baptism, what's the point here? When he says be baptized, what's he driving at? If baptism isn't necessary for conversion, why should they be baptized? Well, baptism was at the time an outward sign of an inward working of repentance. You remember when John came on the scene and he preached a, a message of repentance and he said, be baptized, right? And the people were baptized. Their baptism was a, and this was before conversion, their baptism was an evidence that they see that they have not been walking in right fellowship with God. They have been walking contrary to the ways of God. Their baptism was a sign that they were turning around and going the other direction. To be baptized now for these people, when he says repent and be baptized, to be baptized publicly in the name of Jesus would have been a declaration to the watching world that they were identifying with, they were believing in the one whom they had just a month earlier crucified. You see, this baptism was in essence a fruit of repentance. It was the truth, the proof that the repentance was real. So a man can say, I've repented, but if his life doesn't change, repentance hasn't happened. It's easy to say, I have repented. It's another thing to actually turn around and walk the other direction. To be baptized in the name of Jesus would have been a public declaration that just 50 days ago I was standing at the cross, I was yelling crucify him, I was calling him a criminal, I was spitting on him, now I'm embracing him as my only hope for eternity, I'm identifying with him and I will walk with him even if it costs me my life. Baptism did not merit pardon, it was proof that repentance had occurred. Thereby pardon had been received. It was an outward visible display of an inward invisible reality. Baptism was the proof of repentance. So the problem was their conviction, the prescription was repent and be baptized. The promise is then found in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who has been poured out on us will be poured out on you. Verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Peter says this same Spirit who has been poured on us will be poured on you. The indwelling Spirit, the promise is to all who repent and believe. And I love this because when the Spirit comes to indwell believers, before conversion we are separated, we are aliens, we are hostile towards God. Before conversion we are separated from God. Yet after conversion, God the Holy Spirit literally comes to indwell us. You see, His residence is a sign that we have actually been reconciled to God, that the hostility on both sides, both on the side of man and on the side of God, has been removed. It's a proof that, that our hostility towards God's lordship and God's hostility toward our sin, that those things have been taken care of in Christ. It's been removed. When the Spirit comes to indwell us, it's proof that we have been converted. It's the down payment of the whole. The promise is to those who are sitting there and they're wanting to know what must we do. The promise is the Spirit that is disturbing you right now will come to dwell in you and with His coming will come peace. The promise is repent, be baptized, and you will receive the Spirit of God. And where the Spirit of God is, there is peace. Then he gives a final plea. 
Even though the harvest is ripe, Peter didn't take a chance. Peter pled with them one last time to be reconciled to God. Look at verse 40. I love verse 40. Because it's the, it, the first four or five words sums up my whole ministry. It says, and with many other words. <laughs> and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. We don't have everything that Peter actually preached here. We don't have it all recorded for us. But with many other words, in many other ways, Peter begged them to be reconciled to God. To be saved from the perverse, crooked generation. Notice the perverse, crooked generation that he's referring to here is a group of religious people who think that they do not need Christ. It's a group of religious people who think that Christ is not sufficient and that Christ is not Savior. The perverse generation he's talking about here are those who are religious but still lost. He says, be saved from this perverse generation. And what shows how perverse they really were was that they had crucified the Son of God even after God had, had publicly displayed Him to be His Son, His Messiah. The perverse generation was a religious culture that rejected God and His grace. And Peter looks at these people and he says, Be saved from this perverse generation, from religion without salvation. Peter's final plea for them to be delivered. He wants them to be delivered from the evil of their own unbelief, from the perversity, the crookedness of that generation. And the way they are to be delivered is the only way that any man is ever delivered. And that is by looking to Jesus as both Lord and Christ. So to the church, I, I just want to say, yeah, the times are tough. Hearts are hard, but they're not tougher. They're not harder than they were on the day of Pentecost. He was talking to the group that crucified Jesus. And yes, if, if Jesus was physically here today, they would do the same thing to him again. They would crucify him again. The times are really not so different. What's different is the early church was filled with the Spirit and we're filled with self. I think what we see is that the lack of conviction is often not because of hardened hearts. It's because of the hardness in the hearts of the church. We have not submitted ourselves to Christ. We've not obeyed Christ. We've not really given any thought to how much we need Him. And because we've given so little thought to how much we need Him, we have so little of Him. The trouble is not on the outside. The trouble is on the inside. The culture is not filled with conviction because the church is not filled with the Spirit. When the Spirit's given complete control, He can and will use every believer's broadcast to penetrate perverse hearts, convict calcified sinners. His work of conviction will lead to crisis, and crisis will lead to conversion. Now, I'm only going to spend a very few minutes on this last point. Not only when the Spirit is, is empowering a man, when the Spirit is filling a man, conviction will be experienced. But number, the last thing I want you to see is that converts are also insured. You see, when, when Christians are empowered and Christ is exalted, conviction will be experienced and conviction will lead to a crisis and crisis will lead to conversion. We can be confident of this. If we live our lives yielded, filled by the Holy Spirit, converts will happen. We will see people saved. Look at verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. I love that word gladly because they were, just a moment earlier, they were under the penalty of sin. They were uh, under the judgment of God already. They knew that they had crucified God in the flesh and they were feeling the weight of it. And now Peter has said, all you have to do for forgiveness is turn around and look to Jesus. And gladly they received this. This is a, a word from heaven. It's hope. And they received the word. And the proof that they've truly received it is, the verse 41 tells us, they were baptized. The evidence of their conversion was their, was their obedience. They believed and were baptized as an open confession of their newfound faith and, in and, and their fidelity to Christ. The person who's truly born again, his life will radically change. The same people who 50 days earlier, some of them had been, had been at Pilate's Hall crying, crucified him. The same ones who had been mocking him saying, he saved others, he can't save himself. These same people are now saying, Jesus Christ is both Lord and Messiah. And that day, we're told in verse 41, about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 souls in, in one service. The word added, I think, should be noted because the, the Greek word means to place additionally or lay beside. So, so there are new people placed in the body. There's new people laid outside or laid beside the body. 
I have to point out here, who's doing the adding here? If you skip ahead to verse 47, we're told the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Who, who was saving people here? It was God. It was the Lord here who was growing His church. He and He alone builds His body. But I just want you to see, He uses spirit-filled men to carry that work out. During this one open-air service, the church grew from 120 to over 3,000. And why? It's simply because the Spirit was given control. You see, when the Spirit has control, men will be converted. Now, I'm not saying necessarily this morning, if you give God con complete control of your life, if you yield yourself to Him, I'm not telling you this morning you'll see 3,000 people saved. But I can tell you with confidence you will see some saved. Because God is adding those to His church, and He'll use you in that process. You see, the filling up of the church precedes the filling out of the church. When the Spirit's given control, He will give fruit for the labor. And, and this, this is not the only reason, but it's the only one I have time to focus on this morning. It's just very real that we should consider maybe the reason we see so little fruit is because we are not full of the Spirit. So I, I'm, I'm closing now, and I just want to ask you, and, and I, I want you to really consider this in your own heart. Do you want to see sinners saved? Then be filled with the Spirit. As I close out, I just want to close by asking, because you might be wondering this, we've spent, you know, three, four Sundays talking about this filling of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, and some of you might be saying, okay, I want it, but how? How can I be filled with the Spirit? And I do mean brief is what I'm about to say. I'll just run through these real quickly. How can you be filled with the Spirit? Number one, just suggestions. Number one, be empty. You want to be filled with the Spirit? Be empty. God doesn't share custody. We cannot maintain any rights to our own life and at the same time be filled with the Spirit. You can't say, God, you can have all of me, but it's all of me and nothing else. To be filled with the Spirit is for God to have complete control. So filling begins with absolute surrender. You want to be filled with the Spirit? Be empty of self. To be filled with the Spirit means to be empty of self. So you want to be filled with the Spirit? Number one, you've got to be empty. Number two, you want to be filled with the Spirit, you've got to be clean. God will not pour something so valuable as Himself into a dirty vessel. If you want to be filled by the Spirit, you must be clean. Confess, forsake all known sin in your life. Present yourself to God as a holy and acceptable sacrifice. Present yourself as a usable vessel to God by making sure that you are a clean vessel. So be empty, be clean. Finally, you want to be filled with the Spirit, be open. God can't fill a clean jar. God can't even fill an empty jar if the lid is still screwed on tight. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, you have to open yourself to His control. The coming of the Spirit in Acts 2 was predetermined. It was a sovereign act of God. But the filling of the Spirit, you'll notice, was preceded by prayer. It was when the people were praying, seeking the face of God, yielding themselves to God. That's when they were filled by the Spirit. If you want to be filled by the Spirit, the only person, the only person that stands in the way of you being filled with the Spirit is you. And if you want to be filled with the Spirit, I encourage you, open yourself up to His control. Listen to His voice. Do what He says. Now, interestingly, the instructions I've just given you, be empty, be clean, be open, the instructions I've just mentioned to be filled are also the results of being filled. Because when you are filled with the Spirit, when you are being filled with the Spirit, you will be empty more and more of yourself, and He will push the self out, and He will take control. When you are filled with the Spirit, you will be clean, and you will be living a holy life in obedience to Him. When you are filled with the Spirit, you will be open. So the two really work together. As we do these things to be filled, these are also the results of filling. Filling is simply surrendering absolutely to the control of the Holy Spirit. How is a man filled with alcohol? He is filled by yielding to it. He puts, his bottle to the, he puts the bottle to his lips over and over until what's in the bottle gets in him. So how do we become filled with the Spirit as God's people? The Spirit indwells us. How do we uh, get filled with the Spirit though? We yield ourselves to His control in every action at every moment saying, Yes, Lord, Thy will, not mine. Do you want power for the ministry God's called you to? Then be filled with the Spirit. Do you want to be supernaturally enabled? 
then be filled with the Spirit. Do you desire your life to exalt Christ? Then be filled with the Spirit. Do you want your words to produce conviction? Then be filled with the Spirit. Do you want to see conversions? Then be filled with the Spirit. There is no other way than His way, and His way is to be fully controlled in absolute surrender to His Spirit. Do you want to see God work? Then just as Paul said to the Ephesians, my friends, be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled, be controlled by the Spirit. Father,